So tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Ne- Marion Nestle to Politics and Prose. Nestle is the former Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at the New York. President. The president. It said Emirata. It said Emirata. Okay, that's very wrong. All right. Of Food Studies at New York University and Visiting Professor of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell. She is also the prize-winning author of Food Politics, What to Eat, and Soda Politics. In Unsavory Truth, Nestle reveals the pitfalls of when food companies pay for nutrition research. Although nutrition scientists may believe themselves to be immune from the influence of the food industry, research funded by food companies typically favors their sponsors' interests. What a surprise. Nestle not only lays out the extent to which food companies influence nutrition research, but also suggests how to deal with these problems, restore trust in nutrition science, and give consumers a better chance to make food choices. Alice Waters, author of Coming to My Senses, The Making of a Counterculture Cook, writes, Marion Nestle is a tireless warrior for public health, and her meticulous research and irrefutable arguments are desperately needed right now. This book, as frightening as it is, compels us to discover where true health begins. Nutrition starts in the ground, with real food that is sustainably grown, eaten in season, and alive. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Marion Nessel. Thanks so much, and thanks so much for being here. I lived in Washington from 1986 to 1988, and my past is in this room. (laughs) It's just wonderful to see all of you, and I love this bookstore, and it's just really great to be here. And I was really pleased to be asked to um, come and talk about Unsavory Truth here. I thought what I would do would be to just tell you a little bit about where this book came from, and a little about what's in it, and then we can have a discussion about it. It's likely um, in some ways to be quite a controversial book. I'm already dealing with my first legal action, um, and or the publisher is, um, and the, uh, I don't think it's gonna get very far because I do try to do my research very carefully. Um, But there it is. Um, But let me talk about where this started from. In the 1990s, I was already a professor at NYU. And this, by the way, is what retirement looks like. Um, um, I've kept my office. Nothing's changed. um, uh, In the 1990s, I started going to meetings about childhood obesity. Childhood obesity was becoming a problem. And I would go to these meetings, and speaker after speaker after speaker would say, what are we going to do to make moms feed their kids better? Um, And I thought, really? Nobody ever says anything about food marketing. It's like it's the elephant in the room and everybody is ignoring it. And it's just as if it doesn't exist and the billions of dollars that the food industry spends to try to get kids to eat their products um, is invisible. And in fact, it was invisible and it is invisible because that's the whole purpose of advertising is you want to slip below the radar of critical thinking. So I started paying attention and started um, working on what became my book in 2002, Food Politics, How the Food Industry Influences nutrition and health. And while I was working on that book, I started running across research studies that were funded by food companies that, by a total coincidence, came out with results that were exactly what the food companies hoped they would be. And I, um, I wrote an article about it in 2001 and incorporated the information in that article into food politics. And then I kind of forgot about it. Um, and I didn't think about it again until I was working on Soda Politics, my book that came out in 2015, when I began seeing quite a lot of research funded by Coca-Cola that either said that uh, sugary beverages have nothing to do with obesity, chronic disease, or bad diets, or um, the chief... Uh, federal databases that show a link between sugary drinks and 
chronic diseases have no validity, so you don't have to pay any attention to them, or that exercise was more important than physical activity um, in what your weight was. And so I summarized a few of those in Soda Politics. And, um, and that had kind of triggered a little pay attention. Um, I write a blog almost every day, foodpolitics.com, and I started collecting uh, studies that were funded by food companies that had results favorable to the sponsor's interest. Every time I had five of them, I would post them on my blog. And I did that for a whole year. And at the end of the year, I had 168 studies that were funded by food companies, and 156 of those had results favorable to the sponsor's interest. I could only find 12 that didn't. And this was despite begging readers to, if you see a study that's funded by a food company and it has negative results, please tell me about it. And I was able to come up with 12. Now, this was not a scientific study. I didn't do this in any systematic way. It was just running across studies that came across my desk. And, and the, um, the only conclusion that I could really come up with was that it's easier to find studies funded by food companies that come out with results favorable to the sponsor than it is to find the opposite. Um, but I was kind of thinking about it. And and that was on my mind when, in August 2015, while Soda Politics was at the printer and was completely finished and was, you know, in production, so I couldn't make any changes in it. Um, in August 2015, the New York Times published an article on the front page about how Coca-Cola was funding a group called the Global Energy Balance Network, a group of investigators at the University of Colorado and other places who uh, were arguing that it doesn't matter what you eat and, or drink. You know, everybody's always telling you that it doesn't matter that you need to eat less and move more. You, you don't need to eat less, you need to move more. And you don't even need to move that more if you want to control your body weight. So this seemed kind of incredible, and the people who were doing the Global Energy Balance's website neglected to mention that their group was funded by Coca-Cola. And this was discovered by somebody who was on Twitter, actually, and who, who tipped off the New York Times. And the New York Times reporter spent uh, almost a year investigating this and filed Freedom of Int Information Act requests and got emails between Coca-Cola and these investigators um, that are um, very embarrassing to Coca-Cola. Um, but they showed that Coca-Cola was, in fact, having a great deal of influence on the research of this group. Um, I was quoted in the Times article, and they posted my quote on the on a full inside page, and it ran as a banner across the top of the article, so nobody could miss it. And in the week following the release of that article, I got probably 30 calls from reporters. And what was stunning to me about those calls was how shocked the reporters were. The reporters were shocked that Coca-Cola would fund research that was that self-serving. The reporters were shocked that researchers would take money from Coca-Cola for doing that kind of research. And the reporters were shocked that universities would allow their faculty to do this. I had another book to write, clearly. <laughs> And that was the genesis of this book. It really was. Um, I started collecting the research, and I went to Australia to work with a, an investigator in Australia who writes about conflicts of interest. Um, and I mention that because in 2017, while I was still doing the research for this book, um, a, a really amazing thing happened. The Russians hacked, oh, actually, actually it was 2016. The Russians hacked Hillary Clinton's emails. You remember something about that? <laughs> You're asking, why is she talking about that? Because I was in those emails. Um, the Russians hacked two different sets of emails, and the ones that were from Hillary Clinton's staff were posted on a new website called DC Leaks. 
Um, you may have heard of it. It was not the one with the Podesta emails. It was with, oh, yes, it was. It was, I think it was Podesta and some of the other people. Um, but I got calls um, one day from people I know who said, Marion, you're in the hacked emails. I couldn't believe it. I didn't have anything to do with that campaign. I couldn't imagine. How could I possibly be there? And I looked at them. And sure enough, there I was. Um, and I was there because an advisor to Hillary Clinton, a woman named Capricia Marshall, um, happened to be a consultant for Coca-Cola at the time that she was working on Hillary Clinton's campaign. And her emails were picked up. Um, in the DC leaks cash, and she was paid seven thousand a month by Coca Cola while all this was going on. The emails revealed. Um, so why was I in there? I was in there because I was in when I was in Australia. I gave a talk to the Nutrition um, Association of Australia, and I vaguely remember that. And it was a very small group, a much even a smaller group than this. Uh, and somebody said, you know, there's somebody from Coca-Cola who's in the audience. So I thought, of course there's somebody from Coca-Cola. I had just published Soda Politics. It had come out two or three months before. I figured somebody from Coca-Cola was in every talk I gave. And you know who you are. <laughs> right? So... The representative from Coca-Cola had taken notes on my talk, excellent notes, A plus for getting it dead on right. And those notes, and, and also recommended that my activities in Australia be monitored very closely, and the activities of the woman in whose group I was working, Lisa Biro. Um, and those notes got passed up through uh, the Coca-Cola chain and ended up um, with this vice president that whose correspondence got picked up um, because Capricia Marshall was corresponding with him. Um, so that was kind of fun. And I thought, I'm really flattered. And there is a God because now I know how to start this book. <laughs> It was a gift. It was an absolute gift. So that's how I start the book. I talk about the Coca-Cola emails because those emails not only talked about my lecture in Australia, but they also talked about how Coca-Cola executives were attempting to influence reporters, um, in particular a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Um, they were feeding this reporter information. They were, um, they called him by his first name. They were on a first name basis with a Wall Street Journal reporter. Um, they were giving him information. They were doing everything they possibly could to make sure he got their side of the story. There were also emails in that cache that talked about their relationship with researchers of one kind or another. Um, and that sort of laid out the major themes of this book, which are how, uh, you know, and I, I hate to pick on Coca-Cola because it's just one company, but they got caught was really what happened. Um, they, they've been caught in several caches of emails, and, the, uh, and a lot is known about how Coca-Cola operated, which, by the way, they claim they don't do anymore. Um, when the global energy balance story came out, Coca-Cola was very embarrassed. As a, if a company could be embarrassed, they were embarrassed. Um, and the CEO vowed that they were going to change their practices and they were going to be completely transparent um, and put on their website everybody that they fund. And you can Google Coca-Cola transparency, up comes this website, and it's re if you're gossipy like I am, you just have so much fun seeing who they give money to. Um, but they've... Uh, they list the individuals and they live the, list the organizations, and they've stopped funding 100% of any study. They now only fund 50% of studies. Um, and whether that's going to make any difference, we, we really don't know. Because the basic observation of all of the research that I did is that industry-funded um, studies come out with results that favor the funder. Otherwise, you don't get the money again. Um, and the other overriding theme that goes through all of this is that the researchers who take the money are completely unaware of the 
maybe completely is too strong, but in general, they're unaware that they're being influenced. They say, money doesn't influence me. Uh, it, the funder doesn't matter. It's the science that matters. Um, it has no influence on me. And they get sometimes quite resentful. But there's a huge research basis on that, too. And I review that research in a, in a chapter on drug industry funding. Um, because with the drug industry, there's been at least 60 years a very close investigation of the effects of drug industry funding on physicians' prescription practices, opinions on advisory committee, and advice about drugs. And there have been many, many, there's a library of books written about that topic, and thousands, literally thousands of articles over a 60-year period. With food, despite a lot of searching, I was able to find precisely 11 studies that deal with food industry funding of nutrition, of research on nutrition and health. The first one was published in 2003. The last one was published this, that I found was published this year. They're few and far between. So one interesting question that comes up is why hasn't there been nearly as much interest in food industry funding as there has been in drug industry funding. And I think there are two big reasons for that. One is that drug industry funding is measurable. You can look at physicians' prescription practices before and after gifts and see whether they change their prescription practices. And now that we have the um, Affordable Care Act, one of the things in the Affordable Care Act was the physicians' payment requirement um, where there's a website where drug in companies have to reveal how much money they give to physicians by name. And for those of you who are New York Times readers, if you saw a few weeks ago a, a drug researcher at Sloan Kettering um, who did not disclose his his relationships with food with drug companies uh, in his papers, it was really easy for somebody to find that because all they had to do was look it up on the website, type in his name, and 30 different drug companies came up that were giving him money or whatever it was. We don't have that for food. Um, and it's not as measurable in the same way. Um, we don't have the ability to measure these things. It's very, very easy to do studies that say... Uh, if uh, you want to look at artificial sweeteners, if they're sponsored by um, the companies that make them, or if they're sponsored by independent sources, is there a difference in outcome? Yes, there is. And because uh, Coca-Cola went transparent, transparent, no good deed goes unpunished, um, transparency allows analysis, and several Groups of investigators have looked at what Coca-Cola says about its funding and what the investigators say about Coca-Cola funding in their papers and have found big discrepancies. So there's a huge problem about all of that. And again, it's picking on Coca-Cola because there's just more data available on that. Um, one of the things uh, that surprised me about my casual collection of studies that came out with favorable results was how many different companies were involved. It wasn't just big food companies, Coca-Cola, Nestle, no relation, um, uh, Unilever, and so forth. It was also the producers or trade associations for healthy foods, foods like pecans and avocados and um, pomegranates and blueberries and just about any healthy food you can think of uh, where these companies and trade associations are just desperate for increased market share. Um, and the only thing that sells food products these days is health um, or sweet or sugar, sugar and health. Um, but if you want, if you've got a product that's that's a normally healthy product and you know a fruit or a vegetable, you want to turn it into a superfood so that people will feel like if they eat blueberries, um, one of my favorite examples in the book is the blueberries and erectile dysfunction studies. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if it were that easy? <laughs> Just take care of that. So I have lots and lots of examples throughout the book of. Um, 
of examples of this kind of research and then the press releases that come out afterwards um, and then the headlines that come out afterwards. Um, and I'm hoping through having written about these kinds of things to make people wear more aware that they should pay more attention to who funds the study. I hope that reporters will pay more attention to who funds the studies. I hope that editors of uh, journals will pay more attention to the disclosure statements um, and that this whole system will become more transparent and shed a little bit of light on it. Um, so that's kind of where I am. I should say that in this book, this book is much more personal than most of the books I've written because I felt like I had to be completely transparent about my own relationships with food companies, um, and I certainly have my share of them. And that if I'm going to be holding my colleagues, my professional colleagues, to some kind of professional standard about this, I better tell everybody what my standard is. So um, I talk a lot about that in this book, and if you want to know what it it, you'll have to read it. So, so I'm going to stop now and take questions, I think, or comments or arguments or whatever you like. So, um. I was just standing here because there were no seats, but I do have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went There's to one right there. I went to uh, ag school in the, in the dark ages at mm -hmm. the University of Illinois, and, w and we brought up a... Uh, uh, I think graduated in 79, we brought up a protest. Uh, Francis Morley Pay came and spoke, and, we, and there was this oh. program about uh, food for century three. It was all animal agriculture. But we, what we discovered is we, we, we went to the legislature to talk about this, and we had some professors with us, and it was only a very small amount of money that they were, some of them were getting from the pesticide industry, for instance, mm -hmm. maybe less than 20%. But that small amount really influenced their... Um, their research. So even if they, it wasn't 50% or, and, mm -hmm. you know, just tiny amount, maybe $300. I mean, in those days, this was before some of these public private partnerships were really big. Mm -hmm. So it just seems that they like to work for industry. And now this whole public, I was going to ask you about the public private partnerships mm -hmm. that seem to be such a big deal in, in the drug industry, but it's also in food mm -hmm. research, I'm sure too, any sort of uh, patents and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and how that influences the, the supposedly public interest universities. Now, I heard two questions here. Let me see if I can keep them straight. So th the first one was uh, the amount of money that was involved. The research on drug industry funding shows that all it takes to alter a physician's prescription practices, to get the physician to change from prescribing a generic, um, very inexpensive drug that is very well known to be effective to a company's brand name drug that is much more expensive and may not be as effective, all it takes is a pen and a pad of paper, a prescription pad. That's all it takes. That's been shown over and over and over again. Big gifts work better than small gifts, but even small gifts are very effective, and the most frequent gift is meals, and the meal can be as little as $13 and still be extraordinarily effective in changing prescription practices. So there's a whole psychological literature on this that looks at the influence of gifts. Most scientists are completely unaware of this literature, which is why they're in such great denial about the influence. Um, and what the literature says is that the influence occurs at an unconscious level. The people don't intend to be influenced. They don't realize they're being influenced. Um, they don't recognize the influence, and they deny it and are outraged at the suggestion that it might exist. And yet the empirical research that's been done on it shows that it doesn't take much. We're human. We love getting presents. I love swag. <laughs> So your second question was about public-private partnerships, which everybody is pushing. I see public-private partnerships as an excuse for taking the money. Everybody wants the money. Every researcher wants the money. Every, um, you know, every 
a person who's working at a university needs money for what they're doing. And the idea is to figure out some way to get industry to pay for it without really thinking of what that influence is going to look like um, or without really setting up some kind of guideline. So there's a firewall be in order to maintain integrity. There's a really, really superb book on public-private partnerships coming out I think in February, but from Jonathan Marks, who's an ethicist at Penn State. His book has been delayed for some reason or other, but the um, it's coming out and it's really good. I blurbed it. I, that's how I know about it. Uh, but it's just a huge issue, and he thought it was a big enough issue to write out, to devote a whole book to it. So when I see public-private par partnerships, a flag goes in the air. One of the, the one of the public-private partnerships that I'm really upset about in this book are the ones between food companies and the USDA. Um, the USDA. I'm sorry. Am I stepping on somebody's toes? Um, yeah. The the USDA has um, a, in its marketing, uh, in its in its marketing units, it has. Um, it funds research. It has two different kinds. It has checkoff programs where the the industries, the, this is generic marketing and research, and then there's also marketing programs that are regional um, that raise money from producers so the taxpayers aren't supposed to be paying for it. But they're sponsored with the USDA. The USDA contributes 50% of whatever the whole cost is um, in one way or another. Um, and these studies come out just the way the companies would want them to. What a surprise. And um, a USDA researcher, um, who I have sworn never to reveal the name, um, told me that they were doing studies at USDA that they would not do otherwise if they weren't involved in public-private partnerships with industry. So one of the problems with industry funding, oh, and I, I should mention the problems. The problems are distortion of research, distortion of the research agenda, um, and then loss of trust in science if you find out that this is a sponsored study. Um, many of the disclosures say things like the sponsor had nothing to do with the design conduct or interpretation of the study, but I give many, many examples where through FOIA or open rec records requests, it turns out that's not true. So you can't tell unless you're lucky enough to be dealing with somebody who works at a public university and can be foiled. I work at a private university. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> uh, thank you for your book. Um, I on Tuesdays the health and uh, nutrition sections come out and science sections come out in the newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, and several other places that I've seen articles about dogs needing wheat in their diet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm checking it all out and appreciating what the New York Times presents. And then uh, the owner of this dog that I take care of, she goes to the pet store and the pet store guy goes, oh, the scientists and all, oh, they're just, you know, bought off by Purina and whatever to put wheat in the diet. So anyway, so I, I think it goes beyond people. It goes into pets. It goes into all kinds of you know, participation med mm. medicine. My brother's had a pharmacology at Michigan State. Uh -huh. So it goes on everywhere. And I was just wondering if you've seen this kind of thing. I have two books about pet food. So I love pet food. <laughs> <laughs> and and we discuss in, in the, a book called Feed Your Pet Right, a terrible title, because it's really an analysis of the pet food industry. But it talks about that. Uh, veterinarians don't get any nutrition education at all because all they need to know is which can to choose. Um, the, the, and the only, the ones that do have some nutrition education, it's all done by pet food companies. Um, at Cornell, until very recently, the pet food companies would come into the vet school and any vet student who had a dog or a cat would get free food for the entire 
time they were in veterinary school. Uh, Cornell has stopped that. So. So just one other little thing about uh, salt and carbohydrates. We hear that those are very important to our diet. And yet a lot of people, I think, because they hear about these diets, cut out the salt and the carbohydrates. And I just wonder if you think that has any contribution to a lot of people being crazy. <laughs> yeah, lack, lack of salt and carbohydrates. <laughs> I happen to be in, extremely fond of carbohydrates, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask about that. Um, but the salt issue is a complicated one. Um, any doctor who deals with people with high blood pressure will tell you keep the salt as low as you can. It's pretty hard to eat a low salt diet, and you can't not get some. It's not possible not to get some. Um, and if you eat any processed food at all or eat in any restaurant at all, you're getting plenty of salt. So the, uh, it's the reducing it that's difficult for people with high blood pressure or likely to get high blood pressure. Um, yeah, salt, my favorite topic. Michael, help. <laughs> John. Um, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about what hospitals and universities should do in terms of establishing policies uh, on this. Uh, I, I remember in, uh, in Boston there was a, a, a very negative story about the influence of uh, drug companies on uh, hospital research and one of the largest uh, mm -hmm. hospital systems in, uh, in the city ended up deciding that um, they, they would not allow their um, doctors any longer mm -hmm. to uh, take meals or to go mm -hmm. to conferences that were paid for. But they, they established very um, um, mm -hmm. firm uh, policies that all the doctors had to comply with. I wonder if you think that would be effective. Is that is that the approach that hospitals a, and universities they should take? They have to do that. Yeah. They have to because if you believe this enormous body of research that the influence is unconscious, and let's give people credit. I mean, let, I'm sure there are people who are perfectly well aware um, of the influence, but let's assume that, that it's unconscious. That means that if a drug company is giving a medical student um, um, a stethoscope and it's got a drug on it, um, you know, I, I went to a meeting of the American Diabetes Association some years ago, and I was one of two talks at the entire annual meeting on diet. Everything else. I mean, there was nobody, t and the other one was a, a session sponsored by Coca-Cola. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I was floored. And I, I in my talk, I made some um, sort of negative comment about a diabetes drug that's um, extracted from Gila monsters. And, you know, I, I made some sort of joke about it, and people came up afterwards who were really upset and said, how could you say this about drugs that are really helping people with diabetes? But type 2 diabetes is, a, is largely a dietary problem. If you lose weight, and not even all that much weight, a lot of people could take care of the symptoms of it. And yet, you didn't see anybody talking about that. You didn't see anything on the uh, American Diabetes Association website at that time. And I couldn't understand it until I went to the expo and the exhibit. And I walked into that exhibit, and it was all drug companies. First of all, it was on two floors of an enormous convention center, and it was all drug companies. And they were giving away the greatest stuff. They were giving away stethoscopes and textbooks and lab coats and uh, you know just anything that you can think of. How could you not be influenced by that? And yet you think you're not. We're human, and we think we're not. I think it's a huge problem, and I don't know how else you do it except say no. I did think of, one second, Michael. I, I did think of one way in which it might be possible for food companies to give money for research and not have an influence, and that's if they were taxed and it was mandatory. And if it were mandatory and it were pooled into some common pool and some third party distributed it, then there would be a firewall. Bef but we can't tax food companies for research, and no food company is going to voluntarily give money for research they can't control. Part of the point of all of this is that they can control the research, even if the investigator doesn't realize it. Dr. McGinnis. <laughs> I'm the guy in the suit, so I must be from Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do have, uh, actually, your last point uh, 
uh, preempted my question to you. It related to the feasibility of truly firewalled public-private partnerships. Uh, actually, a committee that uh, uh, that Linda Myers uh, uh, oversaw when she was the head of the Food and Nutrition Board uh, on food marketing to children mm -hmm. made a recommendation of that sort that mm -hmm. essentially uh, food industry would set aside some percentage of their um, advertising. Oh, that's budget. where I got it from. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there would be a match of a similar mm -hmm. variety coming from the federal treasury. Uh, yeah, that was, was an extraordinary report. Uh, it went to report heaven, as these things do. <laughs> um, with a firewall, is mm -hmm. there no strategy that you can possibly see uh, that would allow a similar uh, concept uh, with the research enterprise? Mm -hmm. They have strong interests uh, that are both vested, but also they have a strong interest in knowing more. Well, there are two different kinds of research at stake here. There's basic research, and then there's marketing research. I think a lot of this is marketing research. It's not, you know, there's a, to me, there's a really big difference. I get letters all the time from the Grape Association, the Yogurt Association, um, the whatever, the pecan people uh, saying, we're looking for requests, for, we're putting out a request for proposals for research that will show the benefit of our product. Um, that's one kind of research. And then there's, I think, asking uh, an open-ended question, we really want to know how this product works in the body or we really want to know about physiology is a very different question. But that's not what they're funding. I tell the story in this book about the Nutrition Foundation. The Nutrition Foundation was a group started in the 1920s um, to pool industry, deliberately, to pool industry money um, in order to distribute it to researchers. And they started out by um, developing a, a group of food companies who were willing to give a certain amount of money every year. Um, but the foundation had to please the food companies if they wanted that money to continue. And, you know, either consciously or unconsciously, they had to please it. And the Nutrition Foundation people ended up sounding like spokespeople for the food industry. Um, and eventually they were incorporated into ILSI, the International Life Sciences Institute, which is really a front group for the food industry. Um, so that didn't work. So your point is basically as long as it's voluntary, it's not going to work. Well, would you, if you were a food company, no, I, would you right. voluntarily fund research that might run no, the risk absolutely. of being negative? The real question is how we get it to be involuntary. I would think so. I would think so. You know, how do you do that? And in this political climate, I think that would be very difficult. Hi, Margo. <laughs> this is so much fun. <laughs> I'm having fun. <laughs> So I wondered what advice you have about journalism, right? So yeah. the industry is out there, you know, mm -hmm. generating all these perfect headlines for them, creating all this confusion, you know, purposefully and very mm -hmm. effectively generating all this confusion. What can we do to make, I mean, your book will be terrific in helping to educate, but what kinds of practices should we have for journalism so that is it mostly disclosure of conflicts of interest? I mean, some of these studies to me seem like they shouldn't even be covered because they're such crap, right? They, mm -hmm. um, but neutral what, fluff, I call them. <laughs> <laughs> what, what recommendations mm -hmm. do you have about, you know, how these studies are covered? Well, journalists have codes of ethics. And they're not supposed to have conflicts themselves. So that's one thing. Um, because, you know, I, I mean, I was fascinated by the emails that talked about this particular journalist at the Wall Street Journal. It was just obvious that they were really, really, really trying to co-opt him. Um, did they succeed? He says no. Um, it's I don't know. It's hard to know. He writes complicated stories. It's difficult to know. But we and I don't talk about him in this book because it was a long, complicated story. But the um, uh, it's very much in the interest 
of a food company to have a relationship with the journalists who are covering that company. And they work very hard at it. Uh, so there should be codes of ethics about that. Journalists are not supposed to take gifts. On the other hand, journalists don't have jobs anymore. Um, and the you know the employment for journalists has gotten very difficult. There are fewer and fewer full time jobs. A lot of them are freelancing. Freelancers have to have money, so uh, it's not a very nice situation. You know, I think if you can, you say no. I mean, and I should say I'm in a very privileged position. I had a tenured full salary position at a at a private university that paid me enough to live on not a huge amount but enough to live on and the uh, and that supported my work that's privilege and I, and I am totally recognize that if i did the kind of research that needed a lot of external funding i might have had a much more difficult time you know, I think it's hard. So I think everybody needs ethical standards. Mm. Remember ethics? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, think about ethics. No. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Lucy Sullen. I'm the executive director of 1000 Days. Um, so we are an advocacy organization working mm. on maternal child nutrition. Mm. Um, so definitely hear you on uh, food companies and drug companies and the similarities. Um, a lot of the work that we do is around infant formula marketing mm -hmm. and the big infant mm -hmm. formula producers. Mm -hmm. Half of them are drug companies, half of them mm -hmm. are food companies. Um, and the, the work that we do is focused globally. And I see a lot of global nutrition organizations and efforts um, that have interesting partnerships mm -hmm. uh, with, that uh, these organizations work on undernutrition, but mm -hmm. have partnerships with companies like Coca-Cola, Mars, mm -hmm. uh, PepsiCo, others. And so my question to you beyond to transparency and disclosure, are there rules of the road that nonprofit organizations like mine and others should be following when deciding who to work with? Well, I don't think there's any common standard. Yeah. A lot of organizations have set up criteria for, and the ones that I, that I write about in this book are nutrition organizations. The big ones, the American Society for Nutrition and the uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, have... Um, certainly the Academy has set up, uh, and the um, um, Nutrition Education Society, have set up criteria for companies that are okay to take money from and companies that are not okay to take money from. This is a slippery slope, and a very slippery slope, because um, the Academy, for example, Every, I didn't go to this last academy meeting, but I had a lot of spies. And the, the spies tell me that it's much, much more subdued than it used to be. But the Sugar Association is still there. Should the Sugar Association be sponsoring the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics? Uh, that's a decision that they make about that. Um, in a situation in which you want the money, you want to look for excuses to take the money, and that can get you into very awkward situations. Um, the Academy, at least, has had an organization within it for the last several years, all that organization has closed. Um, but that was working on trying to clean up their corporate um, their corporate interactions. The American Society for Nutrition uh, had a committee that was dealing. Sylvia, what happened to that committee? Um, my understanding is that its report is going to be published soon. That's what the rumors are. But it's it's been almost three years. And um, I'm going to just tell you the gossip I've heard. And I'm sure you're not allowed to say a word about it. So you can't correct me. But the, the gossip that I heard was that the committee was divided on whether the society should take money from food companies or whether they should set up criteria for taking money from food companies. And the, I expect that the report will sort of put out these two ideas and then they're going to ask for public input. No, I can't even get a, I can't even get an expression out of her. Um, so I don't know what's happening with it. But the fact that it took this long to get a report out is somewhat alarming. Um, 
and I, of course, think they shouldn't take it. So are there organizations? Or there are lots of organizations that have set criteria, and I talk about them. Okay. And you will either agree or disagree with yeah. them. But I think it's a slippery slope. Because suppose a company makes products that are fine, and then it buys a company that makes products that aren't yes. fine. Um, you know, I mean, those kinds of things happen. Yeah. On the other hand, if you want the money, is there the, the question is, can you set up some kind of firewall that will really keep the company from having any influence? Not if you believe the psychological literature. That's the problem. Very difficult problem to manage. Good luck with it. Formula <laughs> companies. I wrote about those in a different book. Baby food <laughs> politics is next. I hope. <laughs> no, I've, oh, it's been done. <laughs> You know, it's been done over and over and over again. I wrote about that in Food Politics. No, nothing has changed. Yeah. Um, hi, um, I'm a physician um, from the UK, actually, so we're not mm. allowed to take any. Let's speak a little louder, please. Uh, I'm a physician from the UK, um, uh -huh. so we don't take any. We're not allowed to take any money uh -huh. or kickbacks or even pens. Um, but I was listening to Dean Ornish recently, who's a mm. cardiologist, and he's talked a lot about the evidence for plant-based nutrition and how... Um, there's really good data about its protective effects against mm -hmm. heart disease. And there are a couple of physicians who've talked about this. I just wonder if you'd seen any of the research and what your thoughts were. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of research that plants are good for you. Mm. I'm not sure what your question is asking. So I think he, he pretty much says that the reason why... Um, it's not widespread throughout the medical community to talk about uh, the beneficial, the actual protective beneficial effects of a plant-based diet on heart disease compared to, let's say, pharmaceuticals, and that some of the research uh -huh. that's been published shows it to be more protective, um, that a lot of it is just because of, uh, kind of similar to what you're saying, that there is there's kickback from pharma companies, but there's also kickback well, from... Well, and medical yeah. students go to, don't get trained in nutrition in this country. Mm. They don't get any nutrition education, so I don't know where that would come up. Um, they're not even trained to refer patients to dietitians, as far as I can tell. That's also something that hasn't changed in a very large number of years. Um, the, um, yeah, and that's a problem too. I, I talk, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and then the business about dietary guidelines, uh, there's a lot of concern about industry fundings, funded studies um, and uh, that mess up the dietary guidelines. The example that I use in the book is at the egg industry, where I don't know if any of the, the dietary guidelines, I mean, this is nutrition um, stuff, but the dietary guidelines for Americans are the big policy statement. And the most recent ones, which were in 2015, have the most bizarre thing about eggs I've ever seen. I, I just can't make any sense of it at all. It says you don't have to worry about cholesterol. Eggs are the biggest source of cholesterol in American diets. You don't have to worry about cholesterol. There's no evidence that dietary cholesterol has any effect on heart disease, but you should eat as few eggs as possible. <laughs> I swear to you, that's what it says. I, I don't know what to make of it. You know, the egg industry has funded studies of cholesterol, eggs and cholesterol for a long time. I, I don't know what to, what you make of something like that. Um, and we get to do the dietary guidelines again. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> well, we, we've, we've strayed into just um, questions on dietary research and its findings uh -huh. to some extent, so I feel a little bit safe and <laughs> in, uh, just because it's otherwise off topic, mm -hmm. Pro probably, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I think it was about a week ago that I s saw a column, somebody's column in the New York Times, pretty sure the title was What Makes Us Fat? I don't know if you saw this. this was I can't recent, remember. Pretty sure. But, I try um, not the, to read the things main, like uh, that. Point of the, the, uh, <laughs> the main material in the, mm. in the column was about the results of a very large mouse study mm -hmm. <laughs> in which, um, right. in which uh, there were sort of three dimensions to the, um, uh, the diets of the mice in the study, one being uh, fat, another one being uh, sugar and carbohydrate, and the third being protein. And so apparently it was an extremely large study. 
Uh, and, what's your uh, question? Well, the, <laughs> well, the part of the question was whether you were familiar with this study. Second mm -hmm. of all, do you are you aware of food industry influence on this particular large study? Oh, I'm not. Co okay, yeah. So. Anyway, yeah, it I, sounded like a rather large, rather groundbreaking nutrition uh, uh, thing because of the results. Which yeah, are, you've just hmm. said the magic word. That's one of the words that. I advise people to be very skeptical about. Okay. Groundbreaking, <laughs> breakthrough, everything you thought you knew about nutrition is wrong. Those all send mm. red flags in the air. It's not how science works. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm not familiar with that particular one. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Marion, there used to be a Surgeon General who was producing food reports. Um, should we mourn the passing of that, uh, of that influence? Oh, it's so interesting that you mention that because I went to uh, the event at the New York Academy of Sciences, Academy of Medicine, where five former Surgeon Generals um, got up and mourned the passing of the influence of Surgeon Generals. I worked on the uh, Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health um, that Mike McGinnis was the head of that office at the time. And it was the meant to be the first Surgeon General's report on uh, nutrition. It turned out to be the last. Um, and so, yes, the... You know, we don't have that kind of leadership at the federal level, but let's hope we'll get it eventually. So, yes. Um, anyway, I stop here. Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it.